This is Brighter Futures, the film series about how research can influence policy and change people's lives. It's my great pleasure to welcome Christian Gledich from the Department of Government at the University of Essex, the country's Regis Professor of Political Science. In this episode, we're talking about conflict and cooperation, always salient, perhaps even more so in this era. Uh, Christian, welcome. Uh, tell us a little bit about your research on conflict and cooperation. Yes, so I have a um, broad interest in conflict and uh, cooperation at many levels, um, both between states and within states. And um, I think sometimes when people talk about conflict, they immediately associate it with violence. But people have conflict over lots of issues, and this can be resolved or not resolved in different ways. And my research is interested in understanding in the what uh, type of settings do we get some kind of implicit or tacit agreement? And in what cases are we likely to see one side use violence in order to try to force some kind of settlement? So it's, it's partly assessing a number of kind of uh, indicators and understandings of the way that society and politics and economics is working mm -hmm. and yeah. making some predictions from that as exactly. well? Exactly. Yes, yeah, so very much so. So I think that um, conflict of interest is something that uh, will stay with us but it can be um, uh, <coughs> managed or resolved in different ways. And part of um, uh, my interest is to try to understand what would influence the way conflict of interest leads to particular action or, um, or outcomes. So can you give a, a couple of examples of, of that to, to flesh that out a bit? Yes, certainly. So um, um, especially after the end of the Cold War, there was a big concern that we would be engulfed in a wave of um, ethnic violence where different ethnic groups will, would fight one another. But um, um, although there certainly have been conflicts of that type, uh, we have actually seen less rather than more conflict. And that is to a large extent because we've also gotten better at thinking about how power could be shared, how we could accommodate concerns of different ethnic groups through different kind of autonomy and, and um, uh, recognition of their, their interests. So it's not that uh, everyone necessarily wants the same thing, but we become better at thinking of ways that we can manage these things so that they do not result in violence. And then the outside world has also come up with more effective ways of uh, peacekeeping and conflict management that can try to help actors resolve conflicts when it's difficult for one side to trust the other. Yes, and so some of that, as you said, is inward looking. So are there a couple of particular countries that you would point to that tell us interesting things about how those mechanisms and social interactions have been developed that have been, I suppose you might say, kind of more progressive, that they've allowed more voices to appear and less conflict between them? Um, well, I think there are, are, are many conflicts along the There, there are many, but, yeah. But, uh, but why don't we start, start with the United Kingdom? So the United Kingdom has had tension between different separatist uh, groups, uh, both violent and non-violent. Um, but the evolution and the, um, and the um, uh, Good Friday Agreement, for instance, have found many ways that have converted what was previously often violent and disruptive um, uh, conflicts into, into, uh, into perhaps not <coughs> perfectly um, um <coughs> harmonious, but, uh, but at least not violent conflicts. Mm. And so could you tell us a bit more then about the, the, the finding out, the research that, that you do um, in collaboration with many others who are looking at these sorts of issues across the world, how that kind of research influences big questions about, for example, de democratisation um, or, or, or the choices around kind of policies that, that would flow from that once you've, once you've, I suppose, kind of eliminated some of the direct conflict, then other possibilities start to emerge. Is that, is that part of what, what the, the research is telling us? E yes, I think so. So um, <clears throat> after the end of the Cold War, there was a lot of interest in civil war in part because there was this uh, perception that this was a growing problem. And um, many large institutions like the World Bank set up research projects to study the problem of civil war. Um, but they ended up having a, a, um, a very sort of state-based solution to it. And it was assumed that uh, 
the problem of order was uh, one of weak states. And from this perspective, the logical conclusion would be to shore up the repressive capacity of the government so that it would deter any kind of use of violence. I think what our research did was to try to identify more specifically the grievances that different actors might have. This could be uh, political, certain groups might be excluded from access to political power. That could be economical, some groups may feel systematically disadvantaged. And then see if these grievances in any way were associated with the patterns of violence that we observe. Now that in turn, I think, suggests that there could be another way to um, uh, achieve peace other than through shoring up the repressive capacity of the state. So we can try to find ways to modify political and economic institutions um, to address these grievances. And I think our research shows that um, if we have seen a declining conflict, much of this has come through uh, institutional reform and addressing grievances rather than just shoring up the repressive capacity of the state. Mm. So, so you're suggesting there that, that giving voice but also having a way of listening to that voice specifically around, around grievances is a really important thing because otherwise they're going to remain hidden in, in the kind of the stories about people's culture and the grievances may get stronger over time, perhaps in certain places, they're certainly unlikely to disappear. So. Right, exactly. So if you open political channels for people to voice their grievances by other means, then you might make it less attractive to resort to, to violence. Mm. Now, that also might mean that you would have to offer something in return, but there is at least a path to peace toward uh, compromise and, and making it easier for people to voice their concerns. Yeah, um, I suppose you've got to one. Um, if you are leaders of states or leaders of international organisations, you've got to have an idea of what good looks like. I suppose, um, in other words, to try to to say, well, actually, we're in this country. We could have, um, uh, as you've said, you know, shored up our our political control more, um, or and this is to simplify things, to suggest it's binary, it's not just that. Or we could have mechanisms that allowed voices to be heard to, to strengthen the, the, the subcultures within a country that might be economic or social or, or, or otherwise. Um, has, do, do we kind of understand what good looks like a bit better because of the research? Um, I think part of the problem of translating research into policy implication is that policymakers a lot of time have a lot of different concerns and the specific concerns that are highest on their agenda often depends on what's salient at the time. I think Afghanistan is a good illustration of this. So after 9-11 uh, the US went into Afghanistan because it wanted to retaliate for 9-11 and so the first sort of course of action was to make alliances with lots of warlords in order to topple the government but then later on um, uh, you, <coughs> you started getting concerned about um, sort of what kind of outcomes that you wanted. And there's been a tension throughout between preventing violence, uh, trying to build up certain institutions, and also how much money are you willing to spend on maintaining troops in Afghanistan. And these issues have never really been resolved, and that's why policy often looks inconsistent, because it follows different objectives at the time. Yeah, so if, if the objective is, is more of a military-style one, you're uh, less likely uh, uh, to be thinking about the social institutions that need to be built and supported and helped within a country. I think this is true and also you need to think about what is it that would be stable absent um, external forces supporting them. So if you look at countries like, like I will take Afghanistan as you've, as you've just mentioned, um, uh, you know a stable um, uh, kind of quite progressive country in the 50s and the 60s falls into, for various reasons, uh, many decades of conflict. If, and, and it looks difficult from where we sit in the 2020s. Is there, when you're looking at a country like that, are you thinking, I can imagine how this could work for the people of, of Afghanistan? I mean, many places have come out of conflicts and have, have created successful states. That's true, and, and in, in historical terms, the. Um uh, the uh, proverbial classical failed state was China, which is now a, a, in many ways a very successful state, both economically and uh, in terms of public order. So, um, yes, I mean, I, I think there are um, a number of ways through which order could be uh, realized. Um, 
but it's difficult for outsiders to specify exactly what this uh, ought to be. And, um, and I think I in order to think about our engagement with it, we have to uh, try to think about what our objectives are and how we think that our actions might influence the situation on the ground um, and perhaps not expect miracles in the short term. Yes, indeed. Um, and so with your expertise in political science and looking at conflict and cooperation in this way, what are your priorities and hopes um, for the coming years? I mean, what, the priorities for research and then the hopes for the outcomes uh, for countries as well? Um, well, I think there are a number of interesting trends. Uh, one is that um, uh, in international organizations and in uh, um, policy more general, I think there is a new interest in, in looking at uh, evidence-based research. Um, many countries now have different kind of task force and uh, prediction efforts where they try to look at what do data and research tell us about our current strategic concerns. Um, and um, I think there are also more opportunities for international collaboration. Um, most research innovation is not done by the sole uh, researcher uh, uh, battling through to separate truth from fiction, but it's done as part of large collaborative teams where different people uh, provide different contribution. So these alliances can help to, those, to make those kind of changes? Yes, very much so. It's a little bit like the proverbial cure for cancer. If you find one, it will not be the result of one single breakthrough. It's going to be the result of a cumulative body of research. Yeah. Thank you very much, Christian Gladich. Um, great pleasure chatting today. Um, you've been watching an episode of Brighter Futures. If you'd like to hear more about conversations on how ideas improve lives, then pop along to our sister podcast, Louder Than Words. <laughs> <laughs>